everyone, and welcome to this new top-level CER debate. I'm Bruno Livaver, the Director General of the Center on Regulation in Europe, CER, the independent think tank focusing on the regulation of network industries. You may remember that in the last three months, we've held exciting live stream debates on tech regulation with people like uh, Margaret Vestager, Thierry Breton, Vera Jourova, Pascal Lamy, Mark Zuckerberg, Brad Smith, etc. And this afternoon, we're moving to energy, another key sector of our think tank's activities for a very topical discussion entitled Europe's Net Zero Ambition, Solving the Regulatory and Tech Puzzle. In a State of the Union speech last week, President von der Leyen emphasized, again, a commission's strong commitment to the European Green Deal. She proposed an interim target of at least minus 55% greenhouse gas reduction by 2030. She also announced that 37% of the amounts included in next generation EU, the ambitious union recovery plan would be devoted to the Green Deal and that 30% of these funds would be raised through green bonds. Now, the real issue is obviously to know how we will get there. Answers have been provided to us not later than last Thursday with the publication by the Commission of its 2030 climate target plan. Maximo Micinilli, our Energy and Climate Director, has rightly noted in an op-ed which was published just after the, the Commission's plan that the Commission is announcing the beginning of a new era of radical regulation. And this is so for at least two reasons. First of all, it will affect the fundamental nature of the current energy and climate at communautaire. And the second reason is that it will impact the climate trajectories that have been shaping the European Union recovery and the European economy since the adoption of the 2020 energy and climate package. So it's timely to discuss these issues and to do so. I'm very pleased to, to welcome this afternoon three major players on the current energy scenes. Uh, one is uh, Kadri Simpson, the energy commissioner, who's steering with Franz Timmermans the policy initiatives that I've just outlined. And my other two guests are at the helm of world-class energy companies. Marco Alvera is the CEO of SNAM, the gas infrastructure group, and Leo Bienbaum, the CEO of E.ON, which is uh, present uh, in many European countries. So first of all, thank you wholeheartedly to all three of you for, for joining us. And before we start this conversation, I'd like to remind viewers that uh, they have the possibility to ask questions via Slido with the code hashtag SERENERGY. So let me start with you, Commissioner Simpson. You've announced last week a, a very big range of policy and, and regulatory proposals coming up in the next months and, and years. Now, what the Commission seems to be calling for constitutes a thorough reframing of the current regulatory package. So can you, and that would be my first question, tell us why you think that such huge radical agenda is fit for the green recovery objectives? Thank you and uh, good afternoon. And as you yourself mentioned, well, we are, um, in a very extra, in the middle of very extraordinary times. And from one hand, the next generation EU recovery and resilience package, along with um, a stronger um, EU budget, MFF. And on the other hand, the climate target plan for 2030 and the follow up proposals um, uh, that we will present um, in the middle of next year um, from the Commission uh, side. These are the two sides of the same coin. So it is all geared to make Europe more sustainable and resilient um, and doing so uh, that, um, that we will secure the public acceptance and support because without uh, that, we will not achieve our very ambitious climate target for 2050. So um, we do know that uh, at the time of uncertainty due to the COVID pandemic, the climate target plan 2030 sends a strong forward-looking signal to member states, um, but not only member states and their governments, but also investors and uh, businesses 
um, on the direction of our policies and uh, on where it makes sense to invest because um, a higher emission reduction target for 2030 definitely needs significantly bigger investments than we planned. And yes, major part comes from, uh, from the recovery fund, but we need private investments too. Um, but our recovery plan along with MFF, um, it gives us unprecedented firepower. So 1.8 trillion euros over the next seven years. And 30% uh, of these will be dedicated to uh, climate related expenditure. Um, it will help us to achieve the um, Green Deal objectives. And of course, achieving our climate neutrality agenda requires also the EU and member states work hand in hand. Um, we have first very useful tools. These are national energy and climate plans. Most of, most of the member states presented them before the COVID pandemic um, was here, but well, Last one was uh, Ireland. I just had a wonderful uh, uh, opportunity today to speak with the Irish minister. And now we, we have assessed those um, um, plans on EU level. But, uh, um, and this shows us that, um, that uh, well-designed governance framework matters for de delivering a common decarbonization effort at European level. level. Next uh, month, we will uh, assess all the national energy climate plans one by one. Um, but um, this also gives us a tool how we can front load green investments at the nat national level, um, at the context of recovery and resilience plans, because 37% um, because of the recovery funds must go to the green investments and, uh, and the decarbonization of our energy system. So. Um, uh, so um, this is a very useful tool that we do have along with some member states so that we can uh, finance our flagships, renewables and uh, renovation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Let me, let me pick up on what you said, Commissioner, and turn to Marco Alvera, and I'll, I'll go to, to Leo Bienbaum just after. Marco, are you convinced by what uh, the, the, the Commissioner is saying when she's saying that uh, she's providing decreased uncertainty for decarbonization to take place and, and also giving you the, the necessary clarity to trigger the massive private investment which will be required. Marco. Well, I, I, I think, of course, the ambition that has been set out in the recent uh, hydrogen strategy and in this 55% uh, target is uh, much more consistent with the net zero 2050 outlook than the previous 40%. So there's a lot more coherence in the, in the ambitions. Uh, in order to get to net zero, we need to make investments in a way that is future-proof. And so, uh, yes, uh, our biggest concern uh, before this new stated uh, strategies and this new stated ambition and the decision to uh, revise the renewable uh, policies as well as making the CO2 uh, more ambitious and the ETS reform uh, we, we now see a more consistent path. A lot of the national energy plans that the commissioner was referred to are still based on the older targets, so there will be uh, perhaps a significant realignment to do. But the biggest risk we saw was that the system was going to go to a 2030 scenario, making certain investments that would then not necessarily lead to a 2050 net zero. So in a nutshell, uh, we see a significant de-risking as we are able to build onto that trajectory. Uh, significant uh, challenges remain. My biggest concern is uh, looking at the advances we're making in recent years in the deployment within Europe of new renewable infrastructure. Uh, the uh, magnitude of getting to 55% reduction means that we need to get to around 60 or 70% renewable penetration in the grid. And that requires around 800 gigawatt of incremental renewable uh, production capability, uh, which is basically doubling what we have done so far. And we see a lot of slowing down in countries like Italy and Germany and Spain that are really the success stories in the world of 
renewable penetration, but uh, 800 gigawatt within Europe is almost unthinkable, which is why we need to go abroad and we need to reconsider the way we think about renewables and hydrogen is the way to do so. We need to use renewables uh, as, as an import opportunity uh, in order to achieve these, these very significant targets. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to hydrogen in a, in a minute, but let me first put the same question to, to, to Leo Birnbaum. Leo, do you, do you get with, with the news and the new plans announced last week, more, uh, I would say less uncertainty uh, on the path towards decarbonation and, 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 and perhaps more, more, more certainty about what is required to, for the private investment uh, to, to be mobilized effectively? Yeah, on the one hand, um, obviously, it was not a surprise and we welcome the announcement. I'll say a few words on my company in a second. On the other one, I would just uh, like to introduce some spice into the discussion. Uh, last week, we were actually sitting in uh, Berlin uh, as an association, as an energy association, and we were discussing where do we stand in legislative you know, procedures right now in Berlin. And the fact is that we are right now actually still working on the implementation of the winter package of the EU Commission, which was a few years ago. And now we already saw the new package coming. So what I want to say is, yes, it was a, it was a good announcement. It's certainly leading in a, in a direction which we could support, but whether in the end it's really going to work out will depend on lots of groundwork, which still has to be done in each member states, which will take some more years and which is always forgotten. The moment the EU Commission has announced something, the work really starts. And wow. therefore it's too early to actually say a definitive conclusion. The second comment I would like to make is we are now discussing about renewables and we're discussing also a lot about hydrogen. The point that I would like to make is that the next phase, and I fully agree with Marco, uh, that the next phase is again about doubling again uh, renewable capacity, whether internally, domestically or internationally, I think it's, it's a different discussion. But the real point is we need infrastructure for that. And we need to couple the gas and the electricity infrastructure, and we need to electrify more than we did in the past. The first wave of renewables introduction was easy because the infrastructure was there. But the second wave of renewable infrastructure cannot be integrated into the grids if we don't significantly change the grids. And actually, I'm talking about the distribution grids because those are the ones which are always neglected, and I might say so, Commissioner, uh, have been neglected again, also in the announcement of the Commission of last week. So if you ask me, good target setting is providing some certainty, some clarity, but whether it's enough, the jury is still out there, and certainly I see already critical issues on the distribution uh, infrastructure. Okay, um, fine. I, I would like to, to just to ask you, we'll come back to hydrogen and, and we'll come back to also to the sector integration that you just uh, mentioned, uh, Leonard. But I'd like to hear the commissioner on, on, on one point, which of course is, 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 is very critical. And that is uh, the, the, the distributional impact of the transition. Uh, I mean, we've seen the Yellow Vest movement in, in France last year. Uh, and we saw that one of the key challenges uh, to make the transition happen is going to be its political acceptability, uh, the, the political acceptability of, of the energy transition. Of course, when you're wealthy, you, you're clearly bound to be less affected than most citizens by a tax on, on fossil fuels or, or by the cost of, of making your, your dwelling energy efficient. You've proposed, Commissioner, uh, the Commission has proposed a, a just transition fund of 17.5 billion. You think this will be enough to deal with, with the massive distributional impact of, of the transition? And what do you think is needed to make this transition politically acceptable and therefore successful? If you could just briefly give us your view on that uh, before we move to, to, to the other two uh, uh, more, 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 more technical issues. Please. That's very true. Yes, that's very true that uh, the public acceptance is uh, important for us. And for that reason, the energy efficiency, efficiency first principle is still very valid because, well, this is known to everybody that the cheapest energy is the one that we don't use. And um, 
later this autumn, there will be uh, initiatives that actually help people um, to secure comfortable indoor temperature with lower heating bills. So a renovation wave is one of the ways how we can uh, use less energy because right now we know that uh, for heating and cooling, um, well, um, and wider the uh, building sector um, demands almost 40% of the energy that we use here in EU. You mentioned just transition fund. Well, um, the idea of the just transition fund comes from European Parliament and it was dedicated for coal regions. The spe specific regions that have uh, have been mining for decades. Now the uh, volume of this fund is um, significantly bigger. It is dedicated to all the regions across the EU and not only for mining regions, either um, coal, lignite, um, peat, or oil shale, but also for uh, um, those regions who have um, who have um, industry that uh, that is. Um, um, carbon intensive, um, you can, well, basically this is a specific um, fund to, uh, to cover the, the um, transition from polluting sectors to less polluting uh, industrial, uh, how you can create less polluting industrial jobs. Overall, well, our aim is uh, to secure that uh, renewables will, uh, will become cheaper so that our consumers uh, Will, will not have to pay significantly higher prices. And of course, our opportunity to go finance creeds so that this is not uh, um, the cost that consumers have to pay. Mm. It's also uh, helpful in that regard. Okay, thank you. Uh, among the, the different policy and, and regulatory frameworks that the Commission tends to revise, introduce or, or develop as the, the EU strategy for for energy system integration, which was published last July. And it embeds a concept which could fundamentally change the way the, the energy market and the actors will, will operate. So uh, uh, let's perhaps examine uh, a few minutes what, what system integration means in, in practice. Leo, do, do you foresee new, new business models emerging from, from this uh, new sector integration strategy? Perhaps you could mention some uh, concrete example of sector integration happening today so that we, we understand better what this is about. And perhaps the last question, is that important in terms of benefits for, for citizens and, and energy consumers? Okay, so those have been at least three questions. Um, I'll try this way. Uh, I think we cannot achieve the climate target without the sector integration that has been put forward. And let me give you an example. If we have, let's say a city quarter, where we have a heat demand, we have cooling demand, we have electricity demand and so on. We can certainly make electricity green by putting it on a renewable basis. We can try to at the same time make gas green and so on and then add energy efficient cooling. But uh, we have realized that the way which is most beneficial for consumers is actually to combine the different needs and to find a holistic approach, for example, by actually introducing a low exergy network in which we basically pump around water in a circle. And either we use heat pump to produce heat or actually when we actually have cooling, we inject the heat, which is the waste product, so to say, of cooling into the same circle. So we reuse the energy several times. It's actually, it goes even beyond uh, energy efficiency. The same energy can be used two times, three times, four times. And that actually also allows us to integrate uh, between the different sectors and you can throw into e-mobility, for example. So therefore, if we do energy efficiency via, if we do sector integration, we just get better solutions for customers which are more affordable. And this is why we absolutely need to, we, we believe it needs to be part of the solution. That's question one. And obviously that's also question two, it's we need it and it's also beneficial for consumers. Um, for that, however, we need to make sure that we have the right price signals uh, because right now we are too much in silos and for example the silo of electricity in germany gets all the levies and all the taxes that actually sends the wrong price signal for optimization if we were to actually build such integrated systems 
on the basis of today's price signals, where basically the burden is fully, fully on electricity, we actually would probably build the wrong systems. Economically, we would build what makes sense, but it would be the wrong system. So what we need is we need to strip electricity of price components which are not related to electricity. And we need to make sure that we put the burden on the different fuels according to their CO2 impact. That also would make uh, it possible, for example, to differentiate between different qualities of gas. And so I, uh, and the commission has actually touched on those points. So I would say it's actually a great starting point. And now we need to make sure that we actually implement it in a way so that the system in a right way, so that the systems which we build based on that make sense in the long run. Okay, thank you. Marco, same, uh, same questions. Uh, what are the, uh, the, the, the benefits for you and, and uh, what are the new business models that you can see emerging from, from sector integration? So we used to talk about uh, uh, gas and electricity coupling, but uh, I think we're now moving into a much more profound uh, all sources uh, integration, all sources coupling. Uh, there's uh, something uh, very important that was touched upon by the commissioner in terms of the, the, the cheapest way to cut CO2 is by saving energy. There's a lot that we can do. There is a lot of uh, technology that still hasn't come to market that's available that can help us save. We, we have launched an energy efficiency business and I'm always struck, uh, even just looking at residential, at how much we can do there. And, and Leo touched upon uh, the, the consumer who at the end of the day wants comfort and he wants it affordable. Uh, there is so much lost in translation. There are so many siluses and you measure uh, power in a megawatt hour and or kilowatt uh, uh, hours and you me measure uh, coal in tons, oil in barrels, gas in cubic meters, cubic feet, millions of BTUs, and no one can really compare any of these. We need to measure everything in megawatt hours, make it comparable, and some very striking uh, differences emerge. The most striking is that to store natural gas costs five euros per megawatt hour. To store electricity in a battery costs 200 euros per megawatt hour. So when we think about the fact that Germany, Italy, Austria, uh, we consume six times more energy in the winter than in the summer. Storage is a critical issue when we think about an integrated system. To store hydrogen costs 20 euros per megawatt hour. So you suddenly realize things that if you measure with different units, it's very hard to, to compare. Now, the, the physical steps that we are already beginning to take, and we're working with uh, Terna, which is the Italian electricity grid, we are converting our gas uh, powered compressor units to electricity because we have realized that we have a lot of sp uh, spread out over the country compressor stations that are running on gas. If we make those dual fuel, then we can absorb electricity when the electricity grid has excess power, like when they have too much renewable, and we can give power back in the winter where they need, um, they, they need electricity and there's not enough renewable. So there's a lot of very simple, quick wins that when we think integrated, we can capture all these synergies that, as Leo said, have been really separated because of the lack of price signals and the lack of incentive. Marco, on, on, on that one, in five words, what are, what are the expectations that you have from well, the first, public authorities and from, from the commission in particular? Well, that we, 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 we need to create the incentives to build the 10 year plans, and I think that's already out in the draft proposals I'm seeing, they have to be built together, thinking about electricity and gas. You can no longer, and we're, be, we're doing this already in Italy. The UK is doing it because National Grid has both. But in all other member states, you have an electricity view of the world and a molecule view of the world, and they're just done differently. They need to be orchestrated together. And you can have, like in the UK, upside and downside, distributed versus centralized. You can run different scenarios but they need to run thinking in an integrated way. If, okay. if we, that's why I'm optimistic about the 55%, because if we were stopping at 40%, you could do some patches. You could put 40 gigawatts of batteries just to support that 40% reduction. But if you look beyond 40% to a net zero, those batteries may not be necessary where you've installed them. So the combined planning is the first step. 
Okay, Leo, same question. What do you expect from, from, from the authorities and from the commission in particular for, for, in terms of sector coupling? Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, I, I think actually I mentioned uh, two requests uh, already. One is uh, make sure that we don't get uh, price distortions, uh, especially on the electricity side. And uh, maybe for those listening to this stream afterwards, just as, a, as an explanation, uh, traditionally, the cost of the energy transition so far have been put on the price per kilowatt hour on the electricity side mainly. Therefore, electricity is in relative terms much more expensive towards other fuel carriers in comparison. And that obviously now uh, puts electricity at a disadvantage uh, actually versus other fuel carriers when we actually now uh, continue to build uh, the new energy system. Um, and to mention, we are one of the largest electricity distributors in, in Europe, but also uh, one of a very large gas distributor. So we have actually both. So one is um, actually take away price distortions. The other one is you can replace that by putting taxes, levies and so on on the different energy carriers, depending on their CO2 content. The third one is acknowledge the role of the infrastructure which needs to be in place. Because in the end, uh, if we build renewable stations, let's say uh, uh, outside Europe, as Marco was already alluding to, to import the renewable energy into Europe, we certainly need uh, transmission grids. We need to be able to transport either the electricity or the molecule actually towards Europe. But if we build it within Europe, and we will build a lot uh, continuously within Europe, then we need to actually connect that electricity to our infrastructure and connect it with the consumers. And that requires the distribution grids. Um, and uh, therefore, I think that needs to be acknowledged more. We need to massively invest into distribution grids. And we need to make sure that we have a regulation which actually acknowledges the need for continued further investment. Um, if I have one last comment, and it's maybe a less of a desire of my side, uh, the Commission put forward the proposal of the 55% target in combination with the introduction of a carbon border adjustment tax. I don't know when you or whether you want to touch on it, Bruno, but the issue is obviously uh, this carbon border adjustment tax shall protect European industry from competitors who have no carbon burden, so to say, carbon cost in their products. Now, I have been on two conferences in the last two weeks, uh, mainly German industry, but lots of exporting companies. And we have debated uh, whether, we, uh, whether the people present in the room see the way of actually introducing a carbon border adjustment tax which works and is compatible with the rules of the World Trade Organization. And sadly, I have to say, I found two times an overwhelming majority of people not believing that such a tax is possible. Okay. And obviously, this leaves us with uh, some questions. Okay. Let's let's perhaps uh, make sure that first of all, we we hear about uh, the commissioner's uh, reactions about what you said on uh, on sector integration, um, and then we'll 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 perhaps take the, this uh, uh, the carbon tax, the CBM. Uh, in the second phase. Commissioner, you heard the industry about sector integration. What do you take from that? Yes, I did. And, uh, and of course, um, the higher uh, targets, they do mean that Commission will review by mid-2021 20, uh, um, majority of our energy climate leg legislation just to reflect the increased greenhouse gas emission reduction ambition. And, um, and we do know that uh, we need to put uh, our efforts on decarbonization and uh, energy is a vital role. Energy has a vital role to achieve both our 2030 targets and 2050 targets. So um, there, there are different um, legislative uh, initiatives that you can expect and most probably also revision of uh, EU law on energy efficiency and renewables. But for sure, by the end of this year, we will revise uh, the 10E regulation. So this is a, a regulation that, uh, that guides us how we will finance um, cross-border infrastructure, uh, energy infrastructure, mainly 
uh, twisty breeds, but also how we will address uh, storage and um, the grids uh, that we need uh, for off future offshore uh, wind parks. Um, at the same time, uh, it is very important for us to ensure competition and liquidity of markets. Well, this is a prerequisite to finding the most cost-effective uh, decarbonization pathway. So, um, so um, however, I do accept uh, that uh, right now we do have existing regulatory barriers, and this is necessary to re remove them. Um, but um, but um, we need fair competition between different energy carriers and technologies. And, uh, and uh, this also applies uh, on the regulatory framework of gas. So the third energy package applies to all gases. Um, all gases that can be safely injected to the gas network, but, uh, uh, but this is uh, not necessarily suited for the decarbonization of gases and, and their local production, and it neither applies to network transporting uh, poor hydrogen. So, um, so um, the strategy for energy system integration outlines a vision uh, to create a smarter and more integrated and more optimized energy system um, so that uh, all sectors can fully contribute to decarbonization. And, uh, and hydrogen strategy um, underlines the importance of, um, of hydrogen in the decarbonization efforts and sets up a vision how to upscale demand and supply of renewable hydrogen. And, uh, and of course, we also need a plan how to mobilize the member states and industry um, and how to advance the regulatory framework, how to strengthen the research agenda and how to position hydrogen also internationally. Because we have close uh, neighboring countries who have better weather conditions and who are interested of, uh, of um, the opportunities to become uh, hydrogen exporters. So this is also part of our global outreach, how to guide our closest neighbors so that they will also phase out uh, coal power plants and, uh, and uh, will learn from our experience and use our te technological uh, knowledge. So, um, so this is, uh, well, hydrogen plays a very important part in our sector integration strategy. Thank you. We'll, we'll, with your permission, Leo, we'll, we'll get back to uh, uh, to the carbon tax at, at the end of the of the debate because I see that there are also uh, questions which are being put by the viewers. Uh, among others, uh, obviously, you, you you touch upon something uh, very sensitive uh, among viewers. So interesting. Uh, I'd like to 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 move this discussion. Um, we we talked about sector integration. I think it's intrinsically linked to another debate, and, and, and that is which technologies will help us to, carbon, to decarbonize faster in a, in a cost-efficient manner, and, and which regulatory and, and policy support is needed. The Commission proposed in, in July, last July, I think, the, the, its uh, hydrogen strategy. Uh, and uh, in a state of, of the Union speech, Ursula von der Leyen also stated that she wanted next generation EU, the, the EU recovery plan, to create what she called the, the new uh, European hydrogen valleys, if I, if I remember. So Marco, uh, hydrogen is currently a, a pretty costly technology. How fast will, will cost go down so that hydrogen is, is competitive and, and beneficial to society as a whole? So indeed, the, the, the benefits for Europe of using in a fully decarbonized world um, green gases, so we're talking about hydrogen of many different colors and biomethane, we've estimated in a big study, it's around 200 billion euros per year. Uh, so it, it plays a, a huge role in, in the net zero and in achieving net zero affordably. So we have, we have built a model we think that the cost of hydrogen today is between 100 and 140 dollars per megawatt hour, which is incredibly cheap if we think that 10 years ago it was more than 600. And I'm talking about green hydrogen made from solar. So it went from 600 to 100, mainly because of the fall in the cost of solar, which is mainly thanks 
to the subsidies paid by the consumers in Germany, Italy, Spain, and the UK that made the fall uh, happen globally. Now, we think that if we can get our act together and we need an effort that goes beyond Europe, we need some form of global cooperation. We think that with a, we call it a moonshot, in five years, we can get green hydrogen at around 40 to 45 euros per megawatt hour uh, and, and in Europe. And we think in 10 years, it can go down to 30. Now, to do so, and, and here is where the new 55% target, as well as the hydrogen strategy, really help. We have argued in our study that we need to have a predictable demand for electrolyzers. Once there's predictability in demand, the producers will ramp up production. These objects, which allow us to turn solar or wind energy into hydrogen, are still essentially handmade, uh, built in yards, subscale. Uh, if we scale it up, if we standardize it, if we mass produce them, they can really come down in cost by a factor of three or four. So if we combine the co falling cost of solar and wind and the falling cost of electrolyzers, we can get to those numbers. Now, at Leo was saying, electricity is so expensive today because it's clouded in with a lot of the incentives, a lot of the levies, a lot of the distribution charges. Uh, in some countries, you even pay the television costs on the electricity bill. Um, so, but even if you strip out all those, let's call them externalities or additional costs, today the cost of power at the wholesale level is around 50 or 40 euros per megawatt hour. Now, if the cost of hydrogen can get down to 30 or 40 in the next five to 10 years, you've essentially achieved a lot. And today you can already produce hydrogen upstream in North Africa at around 60 to 70. So it's, it's not a distant technology, it's a technology for today. Now there's a lot that needs to happen to achieve these costs, a lot that needs to happen to harmonize the rules, a lot that needs to happen before we can import hydrogen. A lot of the infrastructure that we referred to before that needs to be developed or upgraded. But the great news is that we can use existing pipelines. We have shown in Italy, we have blended hydrogen and methane in our system for one month, we delivered a 10% hydrogen and gas blend to two uh, industrial users. And we know that our steel in our pipes can take up to 100% hydrogen. We need to replace some of the valves, some of the compressor stations that I mentioned already. Uh, but essentially the steel is the same. And because we already have physical interconnections with North Africa coming into Italy and coming into Spain, and because we have so much interconnectivity in Europe, we need to really work together with the regulators, with the governments, with the commission to understand how we can upgrade the existing infrastructure uh, to make it hydrogen ready. I think this is gonna be a key challenge for the next uh, 18 months. We can't hear you, Bruno. I think you're still on mute. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was thanking you, Marco, for, for this. Um, and thank you for the logistical help. Uh, Leo, what's your take on, on, on this? What's your take on, on hydrogen, on, on its current and, and future costs, and, and, and how are we going to get there? How are we going to get the so-called European hydrogen valleys that uh, the uh, president of the commission announced last week? Yeah, I think there there is... The, the option is there that we get there. Marco just outlined it. Um, basically, if we can make uh, electricity very cheap, we can also make gas very cheap. I would warn um, to think that one technology is the solution of our climate plan. We had this debate again and again. You know, renewables sort it all out. Right now, it feels hydrogen sorts it all out. Tomorrow, I don't know, nuclear fusion sorts it all out. Uh, I think the challenge is so big, or efficiency sorts it all out. I think the challenge is so big, we need everything we can get uh, at the same time. We need the contribution uh, from efficiency, but that will not help us if we cannot at the same time make power with more renewables, which will not help us if we can't distribute it you know, efficiently, which will not help us if we can't couple it with other sectors. So my my take is, it's possible, 
Yeah, certainly cheap gas, cheap hydrogen is possible if we have cheap renewable energy and cheap renewable energy definitely is not an illusion. We are seeing it and we have seen it massively. But again, um, then it, it, it's the nasty details that matter. I pick on the example of uh, Marco. Let's assume we would have enough hydrogen and we would have transported it to the middle of Germany. Then there are people who actually claim we should have dedicated hydrogen networks. If we do that, our consumers will need to pay for the dedicated new systems and they will need to pay for the old gas systems which are still in place as long as we have them. And that will be very expensive if we get a regulation that we can over time increase the share of gas in our gas distribution network, then obviously we can use the existing infrastructure and it will be much cheaper for our clients and customers. So I think um, th stay technology agnostic and neutral. Don't believe that there's one silver bullet that sorts it all out and then really look at the details because otherwise it just becomes very expensive. Okay. Well, we, we hear, I would say, sh shall I say, uh, differences of uh, sensitivities in, in the, the, the gas and the, uh, and the industry uh, perspective, or let's say between Leo and, and, and Marco. Commissioner, what, what, what's your view? What do you hear from, from what is being said? Uh, uh, Marco Alvera is uh, uh, announcing a price which is pretty low for for hydrogen, or how does that fit with what you have, uh, uh, what your services are, are, are forecasting? How do you see the future? Well, price-wise, when we uh, presented our hydrogen strategy this uh, July, then we had to well admit that right now the um, uh, renewable hydrogen uh, is uh, is uh, not cost competitive yet with fossil-based hydrogen. Um, but at the same time, uh, we do see that, um, that if we keep in mind the predictions for carbon price in the future, in the next decade, and uh, we have already witnessed the cost of renewable hydrogen going down itself, electrolyzers costs uh, have already been reduced um, during, even during the past decade, and we do expect that... Um, that compared to today's scale, uh, the price of electrolyzers uh, is expected to half in uh, 2000, by 2030 compared to, to today's economic scale. So um, we do have regions uh, where renewable electricity is cheaper than in other regions. Um, so it is um, reasonable to predict that by 2030, uh, renewable hydrogen is cost competitive with, uh, with fossil-based hydrogen. Um, but I also agree with, uh, with the um, um, position that uh, in decarbonized energy system, um, our energy system will rely on a broad mix of uh, different energy sources and energy carriers. And uh, all the technologies um, that have been mentioned earlier um, we will need them uh, to various extents. Um, so um, there is a role for storage. Um, storage will be a fundamental enabler for integrating uh, large shares of intermittent uh, renewable electricity. Um, another technology that has not been mentioned yet, but this is CCS. This may play a role in uh, hydrogen, but also for the production of the synthetic fuels. And in, in the long term, maybe also for the creation of uh, negative emissions along with uh, combined with um, biomass. Then um, combined heat power. This uh, will develop um, and uh, this secures that there will be no waste heat that we will lose. Um, and of course, this, uh, this uh, relies on stronger district heating uh, networks. And offshore wind will become one of the main elements uh, of the European electricity system. And again, if we are talking about uh, existing infrastructure networks, 
um, and how we can retrofit the existing gas pipelines, then this topic will be addressed um, it, this December when we uh, review that any, um, when, when we will propose that then the regulation um, review provision. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. The, uh, uh, I think we, we heard, we hear you, and I think it's important, and, and also um, we heard it from, from the other speakers, uh, that, of course, we're talking about hydrogen. We could have talk, talked also about uh, other technologies. Uh, you mentioned CCS. We could have mentioned uh, CHP, combined heat and power, uh, offshore wind, etc. Uh, and they're all critical for, for, for the transition. Uh, before we move to, to, to this uh, uh, topic on, on, on the carbon tax, uh, Leo, would you like to, is there anything you want to add after you heard Cathy Simpson on that, on, 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 on hydrogen? Or not necessarily? Because then uh, I would give the floor to, to Marco. No, no, actually, sorry, actually I, I I really like what I'm hearing, so don't get me wrong. So if I have now made some comments which were not, you know, outright enthusiastic, it's just because of the past experience that even great, uh, you know, frameworks don't help us if we don't implement them in the proper way. And uh, if you look at my company, I have only to ben I have only to benefit from an energy transition. I have only uh, distribution networks on the gas and um, and um, power side, and I have only customer business. I have no generation left. So, sincerely, I'm not hit if you do something on the coal side and so on. But I have to send the bills to the customers, and I have to collect the money, including all the levies and the taxes. And if it's done in an inefficient way, I always get the brunt. Yeah. So why are you, you know, ugly utilities so expensive? And actually, a huge amount of the money we collect is just levies in Texas. And to be very fair, we have been horribly inefficient in the past. So also some of the money we collect is really unnecessary money. So I'm just always kind of like fighting that if we now add legislation, let us do it, please, in a way which is most beneficial to our customers, because then it's also most sustainable, you know, then it also gets the most of the buy-in. So I think, uh, you know, no, no additional point that I would like to make. I think I've said it all, but please understand it, why it's actually so important for me. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, useful clarification. Marco. Please. Yes. yes, so I, I fully agree with Leo that we, hydrogen will be one of the many options. We think hydrogen will have a market share between 20 and 25%. So there's 80 to 75% and we need all the technologies. Uh, we, have, we have made many mistakes in energy. Uh, many countries, let's look at Italy, but it's not alone, invested a lot in nuclear, then wrote that off. Then replaced nuclear with oil, wrote that off replaced oil with coal, phasing out of coal, writing that off. A lot of CCGTs not working at full capacity. So as we put all this fresh money, also after COVID and the recovery mechanisms and the just transition mechanisms, the beauty this time around is that as we target net zero and as we build up renewables, those renewables, of course, you may have more efficient panels but once you've allocated land and infrastructure to making solar, that is the final solution. That is the ultimate end game. So we need to get to that end game in the way that is most future proof. We need to avoid intermediate technologies, intermediate steps, intermediate pipelines that we then write off because our bills, as Leo is saying, are full of costs of, of historical mistakes. And we are still in Italy paying nuclear uh, decommissioning liabilities and the referendum was in 1989. So, uh, so we are adamant that the billions and trillions that will be spent are future-proof. And to make them future-proof, we need light regulation. A lot of the gas regulation, a lot of the unbundling was designed to essentially deal with foreign oligopolies that had two or three suppliers controlled the flows of energy into Europe. And the European states, member states had built monopolies. 
And so those monopolies were broken up as a challenge also to the outside suppliers. Hydrogen and, and renewable gases are a completely different league. Hopefully we'll produce a lot of those inside Europe. We will have some exporting hydrogen uh, coming from the North Sea or, or, or North Africa or Eastern Europe, or as I read, Germany wants to go into the Congo with, with uh, uh, hydro-powered uh, hydrogen there. Uh, we will have a lot more optionality from the outside of Europe. So some of the rules that may have made sense to address some foreign oligopolies may not necessarily be the best right now. Right now we need to get our act together, get the technologies going, the costs down. And with only, we think with between 20 and, and 60 billion euros, we can make the existing gas grids ready uh, for hydrogen. So that's very little money. So, so we're in favor of, uh, of a, a future-proof investment strategy. That's what I would call it. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, let, let's take, but perhaps very briefly, because time is, is running and, and I would like to, to close uh, not many minutes after, after four. The, the, the commissioner, the, we, we have a question also, not only from Leo. Leo said, uh, I hear people saying, basically, if I sum, sum up what you said, and, and you will correct me, uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the carbon, uh, uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, would not be uh, WTO compliant, uh, if, if I understand. Uh, somebody else asked us here, I see is the, is the CBM, is the carbon border adjustment mechanism a first attempt to preserve Europe's competitiveness from its unique ambitions to decarbonize the economy? What if these uh, will not be enough? Let's just not look at that as being enough, but First of all, for you, it's clearly WTO compliant, and, and is it an attempt to preserve Europe's competitiveness? Commissioner. Well, um, we have launched right now, now the impact assessment for carbon border uh, adjustment mechanism. And uh, we will, we will um, take a sectoral approach so that, uh, that uh, by next year we know uh, what are the sectors where we could um, test this mechanism? Is it um, cement or steel or fertilizers or el electricity? And, uh, and if we are talking, uh, for example, about electricity, then we do know that we have only some member states who are facing this problem, that uh, they are in the situation where they should phase out um, fossil-based uh, electricity plants. Uh, but the demand is higher than the um, um, production without uh, um, coal power plants. And then they will start importing electricity from neighboring countries. Some of them have not uh, joined the ETS system like, like we do have. And this was never the plan that, uh, that globally we will use the same or even more polluting uh, production uh, pro products um, just uh, while closing down our own um, units. And that's why, uh, that's why I do uh, see the reasoning behind this mechanism. And definitely, um, this is not only about our competitiveness, but it is also um, um, the question that, uh, that uh, um, CO2 emissions here in Europe are important ones, but we are emitting only 9% globally. So we should also guide our partners, trading partners, um, to follow our steps. And this is one, uh, one tool how we can show them that uh, their decisions uh, should, uh, should, uh, should be similar ones uh, that, uh, that we, we take ourselves. And of course, if we are talking about other taxes and levies, then we all know that these are state competencies, all the member states do have different um, systems or different levels uh, for energy taxation. And, uh, and um, this is very diff difficult to change, but my good colleague Paolo Gentiloni is, um, is going to make a try. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we're moving towards, uh, towards the end of this discussion. I, I, I have a, a final question for, First of all, for uh, 
Leo and, and Marco and, and uh, the commissioner will have the last word. Uh, I, I'd like to ask you, gentlemen, what, what are from your respective perspectives the, the key drivers, the key boosters, but also the major hurdles on, on the road to a successful transition to a climate neutral union by 2050? And, and where do you position regulation as it is currently envisaged by the commission among the boosting factors or among the, the hurdles? Uh, Leo. First, I, I think the biggest challenge is obviously that we do the energy transition in a way that uh, we don't lose the support of society for this transition. There is without doubt large scale support in societies, in most societies in Europe for this transition. Now we have to just continue on the path in a way that we don't lose this. And that for me requires that we do it in an efficient way uh, where the consumers actually see why they are paying what they are paying. The prerequisite for that is uh, technology neutrality. I said it already, being opened to efficient solution acknowledging uh, the, the role of infrastructure, especially of existing infrastructure in that, and making sure that we have the right price signals. So in the end, it's very simple answers. It's always the same, but then they need to be translated actually into detailed regulation. I think the regulation that right now is being proposed is emerging out of the fog, can be supportive, and I certainly, uh, pledge all the support that my company, my associations can give uh, to the European Commission. Thank you very much. Marco Advera. So we need, we need some policy nudges. We need some support. Otherwise, the costs uh, of the transition uh, won't happen on their own. ETS is a way. ETS will not be enough. It's good to broaden ETS. We need ETS prices that are higher. Uh, but we also need some specific quotas, some, some blending targets. The most successful, one of the most successful uh, directives has been the clean fuel directive. Not, not many consumers in Europe realize that when they fill up the car, they have biofuels in there. That's a mandatory target that worked a lot better than raising VAT on petrol in France, which created the problems we started this conversation with. So there's, there's ways to, to make those volumes work for a limited period of time that bring then the cost to a point where it competes on its own. So we need those types of very disciplined, very focused uh, efforts, and we need to uh, create and keep competition healthy. Unbundling helps uh, creating a level playing field, but it shouldn't prevent uh, players like us with the technology, the infrastructure, the capital, the knowledge, the capability to, to not participate in this, in this new market that is, that is emerging. So we need all hands on deck, all technologies available, regulatory support, but not to a level where it then limits uh, participants to, 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 to bring their, their capabilities forward. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, what, what's your take from this discussion? Well, um, thank you for a very good uh, discussion. And um, um, I, I do think that well, this current crisis that we face, it is a once in a lifetime opportunity to fast track certain investments. Uh, and definitely, definitely this next generation EU package is all about it. Um, Green Deal that was presented already last year, it was about our growth strategy. And now we have necessary tools to finance it. So we have technological knowledge, we have um, public support, now we have financing too. And uh, the next month, they will be crucial for the success of the Green Deal and for, um, for Europe to grow out of this crisis uh, and build um, a economy that is cleaner and cleaner um, and to build it in a more competitive way. So, um, so um, we all know that our long-term strategy for Europe is uh, climate neutrality by 2050, but we can't wait until... Um, the end date is here. So that's why it was very important to raise our, our uh, targets. And um, now we can expect that in upcoming months, there will be a, um, a opening of different um, legislative proposals. Um, luckily, we do have national energy and climate plans that help us uh, 
and to closely cooperate with all the member states. And, and there was already um, in the governance regulation um, the dates where we can revise also those plans and, and um, change them. So, so this is also very important. And um, the 2021 revision of EU energy key, this will allow to adopt our legal framework. Um, to climate neutrality goal and uh, and also our international commitments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We received many more questions, but uh, due to time constraints, I'm afraid we we, we must conclude the, the conversation. For my part, I'd say that our debate provides another illustration of uh, the unescapable need for the energy sector, the governments, the regulators, the civil society to work together if they are to successfully address the common challenge of climate change and, and the necessary energy transition to a carbon-free environment. It's also clear to me that we need more research to feed the policy, to feed the regulatory process, and allow policymakers to, to properly anticipate the impact of those processes on the markets, on industry, on citizens. I'm referring to, to, to the carbon border adjustment mechanism. We've been uh, touching upon this, but it, we could also talk about the potential scope of the, of the ETS. And, and, and the Just Transition Fund. The Just Transition Fund, we, we have an idea of what this is about, but the, the nature and the effectiveness of the relevant measures to be taken, I think are still far from uh, clear at, at this stage. So I think this clearly constitutes area which uh, require further research. I'd like once again to thank our, our, our three guests, uh, Commissioner Kadri Simpson, uh, Marco Alvera, uh, Leonard Birnbaum, for, for what has been, uh, at least for me, a very stimulating conversation. The video of this live will be available on CERN's YouTube channel shortly. And the debate continues. It continues tomorrow at 2 p.m. Brussels time with a, a CERN webinar to present and discuss a new report on the future of environmental and energy state aid guidelines. Uh, Dieter Jules Jorgensen and Olivier Gerson, who are respectively DG of DGNR and DGCOM, will each deliver a, a keynote speech on that occasion. It's a, it's a webinar. And uh, I would say that if you have not registered yet to that event, well, do so without uh, delay. Uh, we've scheduled other terrific debates and webinars in, in the coming weeks. You'll hear about them soon. So to be kept informed about these and other forthcoming activities, just visit our, our, our site, ser.eu, uh, and, and register to our events. For me, bye-bye. Please do take care of yourself and take care of the others. See you again soon. Thank you.